Uh, good afternoon, uh, all of you. And, uh, you know, in the next hour, uh, including the Q&A, another 15 minutes, uh, we'll cover some of the important frameworks. Uh, more importantly for startups, uh, how do you really focus and prioritize your resources? Uh, because startups do not have lots of resources at their disposal. So it's very important that uh, you know, they focus and then prioritize you know, their activity list. Uh, that helps startups kind of achieve escape velocity. And the frameworks that Abhishek and I are going to talk about are the ones that uh, you know, we have implemented in our portfolio companies. For many of you, um, you know, just a quick intro about India Partners. Uh, we are an early stage venture capital fund. Our focus uh, is really on products, startups in the digital transformation space and healthcare. And, uh, you know, uh, majority of these companies target India markets and some of them go regional and even global. Uh, we've funded uh, AI, uh, healthcare diagnostics like Sictipal to uh, AI processes at the edge, um, alpha ICs, um, imaging radar chip companies like uh, Steradian Semiconductor, SAS software companies like Darwin Box, and uh, even Ekin Care, and voice infrastructure companies like Slang Labs. So our focus is really on uh, early stage product startups in both digital transformation and healthcare. And uh, we start with a check size of half a million to million dollars and go up to four, you know, four million dollars over the life of the company. Uh, you know, that's a quick uh, introduction to India Partners. We go to the next slide. So, uh, you know, the, the objective of this is really. Uh, uh, how do you uh, use these off-the-shelf frameworks? Uh, lots of times we hear about all these uh, methodologies and frameworks, business model canvas, blue ocean, uh, you know, or kind of go-to-market strategies, scorecards, and key performance indicators. Um, so we hear many of these, but uh, how do you make them relevant to your business? How do you, whether you are, you know, very early planning your business or if you have a product and set of early customers. Uh, it's important to know the meaning and the essence of these frameworks and then how do you contextualize these. Like I said earlier, uh, it'll help you focus and prioritize and hence, uh, you know, it'll increase your chances to be successful. We go to the next slide. So there are four components overall, I think align, plan, execute, and monitor. Uh, align is very, very important because this is where the founding team, the core management team, and the rest of uh, you know, the team members. And I know, you know you're all uh, more in early stage, so you may have teams of, I don't know, 10, 15. I know there are companies here uh, who have logged in, you know, who have um, an employee's count more than 25. If you do, let us know. But otherwise, uh, the founding team and the initial management team alignment with the vision, that's very, very important. Uh, then you get into plan. Planning is, you know, you take a look at a business model canvas. You create one for your own product or solution or service. And then in the blue ocean, we will talk about two things, which is strategy canvas and value innovation. And uh, then you get into an execution mode, and now you're going to design go-to-market strategies, a different kind of go-to-market strategies, whether it is dominant, differentiated, or disruptive. And also, uh, you, know, you need to understand where your product or solution uh, or service kind of, which category does that fall into? Is it a market-creating innovation, or is it uh, an efficiency or sustenance-based innovation? And once you get into an execution mode, eventually you got to monitor, right? So you have to monitor your progress in terms of scorecards and metrics. So uh, in this session, since it's an, only an hour, uh, you will get um, certain pointers here. 
uh, but I strongly encourage you to go back and read uh, and uh, watch the videos, uh, read various blogs and white papers, and then work on frameworks uh, that are very relevant for you. And you model your business uh, so that uh, you have complete clarity. And in the process, you need any help, feel free to reach, reach out to us. You know, we're always there through your uh, you know, management team. Ping us if you have any questions or if you're stuck at any particular point. Anything, Abhishek, you want to add at this point of time? Yeah, no, I think, uh, uh, you know, pretty much just to uh, comprehend it, I mean, to, to kind of uh, complement it, uh, this is, this is uh, it's very important to kind of run it what, like, you know, Sapish, you mentioned, run it uh, personally, go through each of these. And I think the second important thing is that uh, don't, uh, you know, while every time you may, you may experience something new and you'll have more clarity, but uh, it's equally important that at certain milestones, you keep revisiting these. Uh, and that's when, you know, you, you'll kind of evolve and, and reach to your destination and, and you know, you, you see the power of things getting sharpened every time. So it, it's an iterative exercise and at the same time, it has to be implemented, you know, more than just uh, going through it, uh, you know, once in theory. We go to the next slide. Uh, we've used, uh, you know, a case study uh, to kind of show you some of the modeling, whether it's business model canvas, a strategy canvas or value innovation. Uh, you know, the case, um, we've used here is a SaaS company. Uh, it's, it kind of delivers human capital management software on the cloud, end-to-end um, -end life cycle of human capital management, recruitment, onboarding, uh, performance management, leave attendance, payroll, compliance, learning and development, as well as um, engagement uh, with all the analytics. And they have taken a mobile first approach, need to coexist with the other applications within the enterprise and uh, started out with target customers as mid-market, but eventually uh, they went after enterprise customers as well. A company again started with India Focus. Today they are in all of Southeast Asia and very rapidly expanding, very successful in terms of not just fundraising and valuations, but also product and revenues and type of customers that they have. So that's an example that we're going to use you know, throughout this presentation. We go to the next slide. So we're going to first watch a video here. Um, and this is a very, very popular video and a bunch of you might have already watched this in the past, but uh, pay attention. Uh, so this is the golden circle by Simon Sinek, uh, you know, start with why. Uh, and, and uh, you know, pay attention and uh, look at this video and then we'll talk about how this plays a role uh, in the overall, uh, you know, team purpose alignment. Go ahead, Arsh. Probably the world's simplest idea. I call it the golden circle. This little idea explains why some organizations and some leaders are able to inspire where others aren't. Every single person, every single organization on the planet knows what they do 100%. Some know how they do it. But very, very few people or organizations know why they do what they do. By why, I mean what's your purpose, what's your cause, what's your belief, and why should anyone care? The inspired leaders and the inspire or inspired organizations all think, act, and communicate from the inside out. Let me give you an example. If Apple were like everyone else, a marketing message from them might sound like this. We make great computers. They're beautifully designed, simple to use, and user-friendly. Want to buy one? Nah. That's how most marketing is done. That's how most sales is done. We say what we do. We say how we're different or how we're better, and we expect some sort of behavior, a purchase, a vote, something like that. Here's how Apple actually communicates. Everything we do, we believe in challenging the status quo. We believe in thinking differently. The way we challenge the status quo is by making our products beautifully designed, simple to use, and user-friendly. Want to buy one? People don't buy what you do, people buy why you do it. The goal is not to do business with anybody, with everybody who needs what you have. The goal is to do business with people who believe what you believe. Again, the goal is not just to sell people who need what you have, the goal is to sell to people who believe what you believe. If you um, hire people just because they can do a job, they'll work for your money. But if you hire people who believe what you believe, they work for you with blood and sweat and tears. So, uh, you know, that's so important, actually, uh, 
uh, in the end, it's the purpose. Um, your vision is why all of you as founders um, have not pursued the greener pastures. Uh, you've taken the rough road. Uh, you want to go build a product that kind of makes this world a better place to live. And, uh, you know, you're working very hard. I mean, while, uh, you know, you don't have the certainty whether you're going to win or lose, but you have the clarity of what to do next. So because of that purpose, you all kind of come together. And the init initial founding team, you're lucky if you have one or two more people to be with you along the journey. Uh, we've seen very often, uh, you know, if you really look at your idea and then the critical success factors necessary for you to be successful, uh, you know, you should bring in founders with complementary skills. You know, let's say if it's a SaaS company, you should have a world-class tech person, but also a great marketeer. That's very, very important. Let's say if it's a medical device company, I mean, you want someone, you know, who's very good in hardware as well as, uh, you know, the algorithms and the firmware. At the same time, you want someone with domain expertise and who also can connect with uh, either verification agencies or the distribution side of the story. So purpose brings kind of the real people or the founding team together. Then your team, the set of people, the first 20, 30 people that join you also join you because either they like the people who are already in the company or they like your purpose or they like your vision. Very often what we find is that people think that they're all aligned, but that's not the case. Uh, when you go through certain set of questionnaires and when you go through certain set of discussions, dedicated discussions, you understand the delta in terms of thinking of, of each of these teams. And that's kind of what causes the friction, what causes people pulling uh, you, know, you in different directions, which makes the company's journey a bit unproductive and you cannot afford that. And hence team purpose alignment becomes very, very important. You go to the next slide. So here is a sample questionnaire, right? For the founders and you, know, you, can, you can read uh, you know, our blog um, as well on this. Um, so you need to know what is the purpose for your company and, and why did you choose this as a career option? And it's very important, even you know, your first 20, 30, 40 direct hires, you should ask them, why would customers buy your product or service? And what are your, the critical success factors for you to succeed? Uh, you should get their inputs. It should not always be the founder or the CEO or the CDO or the investor inputs. You need to get the initial core team's inputs as well. And that is the only way they can relate to your journey and the challenges that your company has to be prepared for. A simple example, you know, let's say prior to COVID-19, if you had done this, and now, you know, during this pandemic time, during the crisis situation, all your team members would know that you've got to really cut down your cost, you've got to focus a lot, and then you need to be in the game, right? Stay alive, so that once situation kind of comes back to normal, uh, you know, you then can pursue your growth plans aggressively. If you didn't have that kind of a discussion, it becomes a very difficult conversation. Uh, you know, whether it's cost cuts, whether it's product rationalization, roadmap rationalization, whatever. And also very important, since you would all spend, you know, 15, 16 hours at work or either working or thinking work, uh, it's very important for people to be happy. So this is a kind of a sample questionnaire that people would independently answer and then they would come together in a team setting and then huddle. We go to the next slide. So same thing, we took the SaaS company, you know, through a structured kind of a workshop. And this is the uh, result of, of their huddle. Uh, they, their purpose or their vision was, or their why, you know, as per Simon Sinek, was consumerization of enterprise software. Uh, you know, they wanted to make this enterprise software, very simple, easy to use, intuitive, a quick time to value, wanted to bring in the mobility cloud, big data themes together. And uh, also, you know, just make sure that this is relevant across all, you know, 
uh, tiers of human resources. They start with human capital management or HR because it is a core function for every company out there. And that's the most precious capital. They wanted to build a world-class product company from India, a B2B company, and also make India proud. We've seen IT services, semiconductor services, pharma services companies built out of India. We've also seen great internet and mobility startups built out of India for India markets. But now it's time for Indian startups to build world-class products, and that was their purpose. We'll go to the next slide. So, so this kind of summarizes everything that you've heard so far. A purpose is what kind of it brings the team together, and the initial team members start with that vision. I mean, same thing like uh, Professor Ashok or you know all of the folks at IIT. Um, Ras, you know, whether it's RTBI or the incubation cell, um, you know, there is a purpose. You know, they want to really support not just Allens, but great entrepreneurs build fantastic products. RTBI has a specific purpose. Your healthcare incubator would have another purpose. And then people kind of come together to achieve that purpose. And more people join because there are other people involved. I mean, they say, you know, look, if you're in it, I'm going to be part of the journey. So people kind of join the journey because they see other people who they like and who they get inspired by. And then progress is very important because if you don't make progress, you won't be able to pay, right? So very, very important. You know, first three months, six months, purpose people may kind of bind the teams together and keep the energy levels very high. But eventually, if you don't have the progress, you won't be able to pay. And if you don't pay, you know, it's very tough to keep people together. So that's the um, overall, you know, team purpose alignment. If you have any questions, uh, you know, happy to uh, happy to answer those now, or we could do this at the end of the session. Okay, we move to the uh, you know the next section. Um, Abhishek uh, will talk about uh, business model canvas. Yeah, uh, so uh, yeah, can we, uh, can we play the video uh, and go to the next slide, Ashita? Yeah. <laughs> An organization's business model can be described with nine basic building blocks. Your customer segments, your value proposition for each segment, the channels to reach customers, customer relationships you establish, the revenue streams you generate, the key resources and key activities you require to create value, the key partners, and the cost structure of the business model. But it's not sufficient to just enumerate the nine building blocks. What you really want to do is to map them out on a pre-structured canvas. This is what we call the business model canvas, a tool that helps you map, discuss, design, and invent new business models. Let's briefly go through the nine building blocks, starting with the customer segments. These are all the people or organizations for which you're creating value. This includes simple users and paying customers. For each segment, you have a specific value proposition. These are the bundles of products and services that create value for your customers. Channels describe through which touch points you're interacting with customers and delivering value. Customer relationships outline the type of relationship you're establishing with your customers. The revenue streams make clear how and through which pricing mechanisms your business model is capturing value. Then you need to describe the infrastructure to create, deliver, and capture value. The key resources show which assets are indispensable in your business model. Key activities show which things you really need to be able to perform well. The key partners show who can help you leverage your business model. Since you won't earn all key resources yourself, you will perform all key activities. And once you understand your business model's infrastructure, you'll also have an idea of its cost structure. So with the business model canvas, you can map out your entire business model in one image. This works for startup entrepreneurs just as well as for the most senior executives.
yeah so uh, you know i think i think uh, uh, let me let me maybe uh, add very quickly two points where satish left and uh, also kind of uh, uh, you know uh, take this forward in a more contextual manner i think uh, you know you talked about uh, uh, the, the purpose and two things uh, what most of us uh, as while running startups and as entrepreneurs we also try to kind of discover is is a very strong storytelling right and and as i've, I've seen uh, places where alignment is potentially the first step uh, towards building any sort of uh, storytelling you know unless and until you have clarity amongst your core team members what is the direction and what is the vision you have your you know you have for your product as well as for your company what what's the value propositions you know etc etc I, i don't think uh you can pitch well in a form and manner uh, which gets resonated and communicated to the right audiences in a in a right manner uh the second thing is of course i think it it's still relatively easier when you're starting up with with core team members because you've known most of them most of the time uh, and and more or less aligned with the thought process but as you scale the business and and that's where i think the relevance of the question where satish was trying to understand uh how many of you have more than 25 people as employees is is uh, the you know there is even more i think uh, required effort and and intention uh, for having such similar exercises so that your management and you know have the right alignment and they carry forward and take it forward in a right uh, i would say you know uh, communication and articulation and and see that as a group you know you all uh, remain unified and aligned and i think that's become even more critical coming to you know a business model canvas and i think there's a short video that was played uh, again i'm pretty sure you know these are these this is probably one of those buzzwords uh, which uh, uh, come more often than not in your discussions uh, whether with your fellow uh, you know fellow uh, entrepreneurs uh, uh, you know mentors or your friends and most importantly even while talking to the vcs or investors uh, and i think uh, you know while it's very very simply understood Uh, what i've seen most of the time people struggling with is to even fundamentally define what business model is and 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 i think that's been predominantly the origination and the germination of of a very strong framework and tool like uh, you know business model canvas again uh, i'm i'm quite sure that majority of you would have gone through you know read about it uh, in the past uh, but i think you know we will we will try and and bring out certain factors along with you know some of the uh, uh, the relevant example and use case that we've highlighted in the previous section as well uh, you know idea at the behind and, and this has been coming out of my experience out of interactions with various uh, entrepreneur sets at various forums events you know, when you typically ask people about business model i think the fundamental question becomes is how do you define right so some talk about it in a in a in a profitability manner some talk about it with their sales strategy you know some talk about it with their pricing models and fundamentally that's where i think uh, you know uh, this was a very very beautiful framework uh, first of all i think used by a gentleman called steve blank author as well as uh, you know entrepreneur in the past as well uh, in testing this and putting framework in 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 the startup context uh, if you look at it uh, you know at a very high level if you saw the video uh, you know essentially what it does it, it provides a, a very quick uh, you know birds eye view uh, of your business to you right uh, it has various section uh, but the idea is uh, you know for for you guys for entrepreneurs to have a, a a tool and to empower them to visualize create and at the same time test certain hypotheses uh, and and put those things uh, you know uh, i mean build certain models and put those things in test uh, essentially this is your one of the first step towards uh you know what we typically call a product market fit and unless and until you start visualizing things putting it at certain perspective you know carving out in a very clear business model canvas it becomes very difficult for you to even communicate and and most importantly understand how each of these interconnect with itself and how you know, one can be used uh to bring out certain sort of advantages uh so very very quickly i think uh you know of course it highlights some of the critical success factors and and you know what uh, uh what's the gap and what kind of uh, should be the priorities and the focus areas uh, clearly you know as a team this is something which should be done and we believe you know it's good to do and visit and revisit it once in few quarters uh, at the same time i think it becomes even more important that significant times such as these 
where you want to take a step back and kind of see, you know, where are some of the headwinds and tailwinds coming from, and if there's something uh, given your business uh, where you know you 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 can bring out certain more elements as well, right? And 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 put those on priority. Uh, we'll go to the next slide, uh, Ashita. So uh, again, I think we'll dwell a lot more deeper, you know, on this section, uh, maybe when we're running the use case. But at a high level, if you look at it, I think essentially the BNC, you know, what we call, as we call it, is made up of nine elemental blocks. The whole right side of the column is essentially uh, what you as, as a business or organization has an external stakeholders like, you know, which essentially boils down to uh, your customers. Uh, whether it's, uh, you know, uh, who are the customers, if essentially, you know, uh, predominantly for your business, uh, what what the uh, uh, typical profile of the users uh, two is you know how do you reach out to those set of customers so what channels would you use uh, are the effective channels for you to reach out those customer segments you know three is what what is the value proposition that you're selling them right versus vis-a-vis uh, -vis your product as well as services what is it that you are delivering uh, uh, for them uh, which helps them in turn achieve their job right uh, fourth is, you know, again, what kind of uh, customer relationships do you want to uh, create or, or kind of, uh, you know, generate, right? Um, if you look at the left-hand side, essentially it talks about as an organization, what you should do at the back end to achieve all these objectives, you know, vis-a-vis -vis your customers. So uh, what are the critical resources that you should have in place uh, to have products which can serve those meaningful value propositions, uh, you know, critical resources, uh, it could be capital, it could be, uh, you know, human capital uh, and, and several other kind of uh, very, very significant partnerships, etc. What are the key activities that you should uh, focus on depending on your business? Uh, you know, what kind of uh, channels? Is it is it direct? Is it indirect? You know, if it's direct, uh, it's, 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 uh, uh, which kind of forums do you go, should you go for? And, and, and uh, uh, again, you know, what kind of relationships? keeping your customer relationships in mind, you know, what kind of key activities you should bring that in, into your flavor. Finally, you know, when, when we talked about as a channel, uh, one is of course as a distribution channel, the other is even for your product and service to work, what kind of key technology partnerships, you know, you should look for, what kind of key supplier partnerships, you know, you should look for. Uh, so essentially this whole gamut is what as an organization you should work at the back end. Uh, to ensure that you could deliver, you know, what you have on the right side of, of the things. And, and that's how it simply kind of carves out, you know, your business model canvas and the way you can visualize, start visualizing things. Of course, uh, you know, the lower bottom ones, uh, 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 you know, last but certainly not the least, uh, the left-hand side essentially put things in a very, very specific and tangible perspective. Uh, what would it take for you to bring out all these elements on the left-hand side, right? As far as key resources, key activities, and partnerships are concerned, uh, uh, you know, as a means. And that will also help you kind of define and, and understand a bit more uh, about your pricing structure, your pricing strategy, which kind of translates into, in, into, you know, clear set of revenue streams. So as, a, as an organization, I think it's very important for you to understand uh, you know, these nine elemental blocks, right? Where you're getting your revenue streams from, who is going to pay you, what is the cost that you are, you know, incurring in, in achieving some of those uh, back-end sort of uh, requirements, initiatives for you to serve to the right side of the segment, which is, you know, the building those customer segments, uh, tapping out effective channels and, and ensuring that you have the healthy customer relationships that you want to target. If, if, you, if you go into the next slide, Rashita, we'll get into more specifics. So this again, I think, uh, uh, you know, in continuation to uh, the the HCM SaaS company that we've picked for reference, we you know did it for the same. If you look at it, ideally, you know, this is something where you should start from your customer segment as a framework. I've seen this as a very very you know uh, strong practice. If you start from the customer segment, so it's important for you to define. Uh, if you look at them, you know, for them, the way they started off, uh, they were very, very clear. It was more the medium and large corporate uh, that's at the customer level, at the enterprise level. And the second is more with respect to who is going to be your user, right? So it, it's equally important for you to understand that effect, effectively and eventually who is going to use my product. Uh, they are influencers, you know, there are decision makers and there are users as well. A lot of times, you know, they converge. Uh, a lot of times they don't. 
uh, and that doesn't mean that uh, any one of it uh, has a lesser importance or role to play so therefore it's extremely critical to understand you know who is going to buy your product or service and who eventually is going to use that service and product right so for them it's hr uh, it's managers uh, it's employees and executives uh, similarly if you look at uh, you know uh, the the value proposition again where they went out with was you know they wanted to have an integrated module uh, having all the best of the standards for all these diverse hr applications you know it talks about the lab that is leave attendant payroll the performance management the employee engage employee engagement and and they saw that you know customers were fed up to kind of independently deal with separate vendors for each of those modules and they wanted to bring the best of it uh, you know with an 8020 rule and go with an integrated platform uh, for for a lot of these medium and large corporates and aspiring set of customers second is uh, you know consumer like simple intuitive uh, you know user interface uh, of course with more and more users being your uh, you know millennials or even uh, uh, you know kind of mid age group where there are a lot more tech savvy lot more consumer app uh, you know savvy and that's the that's the experience that they've gotten used to and you would want to play on that you would want to make that this becomes extremely uh, uh, you know highly adopted right uh, the moment you go so the user adoption becomes extremely important the third you know uh, again mobile first approach with different business models coming into play distributed uh, you know the uh, business models coming into play distributed workforce field force etc i think it becomes extremely important to understand your workflows and then fit your you know mobile first approach that that gives a very strong uh, you know uh, differentiated play and experience as well uh, similarly you know uh, customer relationships you, you think about implementation onboarding you know the employee onboarding if you if you look at the channels for them you know there's an in the inside sales there's an outbound you know outbound is largely driven of course uh, uh, you know through paid marketing or you can uh, through certain certain selected conferences uh, forums etc industry events thought leadership uh, if you come to the left hand side i think for for a product of this nature to come it was it's very clear you know that that they would need people who understand not only the technology and the know how of how to build something you know so concrete uh, while at the same time having this kind of a ui ux and 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 easy to use feel they would also need a very strong domain understanding right someone who who has gone through the cycles of human resources understand the 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 nuts and bolts and at later stage as you evolve we even understand it contextually in different verticals different uh, you know uh, set of uh, business focuses and business models as well uh, so that becomes critical you know some of the key activities in terms of how do you create awareness Uh, how do you ensure that uh, you know more and more onboarding happens uh, seamless onboarding happens etc etc so what could be the key technology you know partnerships or certain other value added partnerships uh, you know distributed partnerships and then these are the costs you know the people cost infrastructure cost uh, sales and marketing and and as a revenue stream very clearly you know we'll have a monthly recurring revenue subscription model you could have a certain bit of customization you know required as a one time setup fee as well Uh, so so these you know this is how i think on the piece of paper it comes out very very simple and a lot of times it it is there in our minds it's very intuitive but i think it's extremely important to uh, record these because the you know one is to put this and and it helps you kind of put to test some of these hypotheses uh, and help you correct readjust as and when required uh you know the second level of bnc obviously comes when you have achieved a bit of a product market fit you start seeing some of the reactions and the interconnections as how you can play you know with let's say channels uh, to scale at a certain stage versus maybe you know value proposition and that brings maybe a very very common example to my mind which is about you know microsoft right as a as a tech player that's what they essentially did i think they went out in a market where there were all other competitors as well but what essentially they played on is is the cost structure which is uh, you know which drove them uh, and pushed them to have a more competitive and affordable price point and two is having a very very effective channel and distribution strategy and and they leveraged that so so uh, i think that becomes extremely critical uh, you know for 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 the team to uh, understand the bmc get your you know birds eye view uh, understand the elements of the business model and and do it on a quarterly basis to see and to to you know once you execute things to see what are the elements which are working and where are things where a certain sort of adjustment needs to happen i'll i'll uh, maybe you know pause here uh, 
any questions maybe satish if you want to add something before i'll open up open it up for questions or comments from others no no i think i think i'm good um, you know you don't need to write lots of points in each of those either columns um i think uh, the three most important things um i think you know if you kind of really pen pen down those and then uh, reflect on them very deeply i think that's very very important uh, you know who are your customers what kind of relationship you want to have what's your value proposition what's your go to market eventually you know what do you need within your ecosystem whether it's activities or partners or resources and uh, you know how do you make money how much does it cost you i mean it is as simple as that um so having complete clarity and being very very crisp uh is extremely important yeah we move to the next slide uh, maybe you know we take the questions in the end uh sure. yeah so i think a lot of us know you know who our customers are and i always ask this right our entrepreneurs you know either who we fund or who we are about to fund okay you know Uh, close your eyes and you know if your prayers were to come true who's who is that ideal customer and assume some a genie is going to make those customers available to you define the characteristics of those customers uh, many times uh, people struggle in terms of who are they uh, how big which vertical how much revenue decision maker influencer before and after you know before your product or solution is used by them afterwards how would their life be any different so so i think um, it's very important to think about you know what it is we go to the next slide this is a great video um, watch this video it's from clayton christensen uh, who is a professor at harvard business school he passed away recently yeah go ahead My name is Clay Christian, and I'm a professor at the Harvard Business School. I brought with me a set of puzzles, all related to innovation. We decided that the way we teach marketing is at the core of what makes motivation difficult to achieve. The most helpful way we've thought of it so far is that we actually hire products to do things for us. And understanding what job we have to do in our lives for which we would hire a product is really the key to cracking this problem of motivating customers to buy what we're offering. What job were you trying to do for yourself that caused you to come here and hire that milkshake? and they'd struggle to answer so we'd then help them by asking other questions like well think about the last time you were in the same situation meeting to get the same job done but you didn't come here to hire a milkshake what did you hire and then as we put all of their answers together it became clear that they all had the same job to do in the morning any of the comp competitors which in the customers minds are not burger king milkshakes but it's bananas donuts bagels snickers bars coffee and so on but i hope you can see how if you understand the job how to improve the product becomes just obvious yeah so um i think um you know if you pay attention to what uh, you know professor clayton uh, christensen said uh you need to understand the emotional triggers how your customers make decisions and you also need to know that your customers have multiple options right so we always ask you know who are your competitors and a lot of us again struggle the way we struggle to define who our ideal customer is we also struggle and we come up saying you know there's no one who is doing something like this and we are the only one but it could be your competitors it could be other options that a customer has to get the job done versus you know your solution so from a customer perspective you know there are three alternatives uh either use certain mechanisms to get job done or buy from your competitor or evaluate your product or solution so knowing that uh in depth is going to be very important as you kind of define your go to market strategy and what 
uh, Professor Clayton talked about is really when they were helping a milkshake company to put together the go-to-market strategy, he said that the competition for that milkshake company was not another milkshake company, but it was bananas, donuts, uh, snicker bars, so chocolates or fruit or a donut a company. So it is not a milkshake company. So it's very important to think uh, holistically when you are understanding, trying to understand your customer value proposition and your go-to-market. We move to Blue Ocean. Inside of Blue Ocean, we're going to cover a couple of topics. I'll talk about strategy canvas. Abhishek will talk about value innovation. We go to the next slide. We, we can go to the next slide. So in strategy canvas, what you need to do, right? You know, if you have a particular product or solution, um, take the SaaS company, you know, they were doing SaaS HR software. Uh, you need to look at four or five key uh, metrics that a customer cares about. What are the deciding factors for the customer? How do they purchase this particular piece of software? And so you need to choose those four or five decision-making factors from a customer perspective. That's extremely important. And then the second thing then is you also look at who are the other players. Like I talked about previously, uh, it's not just your competition. There may be other options for customers. Uh, you know, it could be Zinao's effort, uh, an IT team that could build this piece of software, right? So today, take a look at the mask. I mean, you could go buy an N95 mask or you could stitch one or you could simply tie a handkerchief. Uh, all kinds of approaches you get to see out there. So choose those set of factors that your customer cares about. Look at the player's landscape and then rank them, you know, rank order them and give them the scores. Um, and be very honest when you do that, right? So in here for the SaaS company, the customer cared about deep functionality configurability and customization that was important. Enterprise integration, which is kind of coexistence with other applications and price and affordability. If these are like four or five key decision-making factors and the alternatives for this HR startup or competition was, uh, it could be companies like Oracle and SAP, like ERP, MNC ERPs. It could be internal IT or it could be other startup, you know, that's also building uh, a piece of software very similar to this company. And then you start, you know, primarily ranking uh, these from a customer's point of view. Uh, what, are, what are the features that are very important and how do you rank against these solutions that are available in the market? And if you kind of do an honest assessment, then you will know where you do much better or where you're doing much better and where you need to improve. And you go back to like Blue Ocean, uh, sorry, uh, Business Model Canvas. Uh, that's where you, know, you may have to prioritize either partnerships or activities or resources. If in particular areas where your customer cares a lot, but you don't have what it takes to win against the competition and to convince your customer, then you have to prioritize those activities. So that's what Strategy Canvas is all about. Pick a set of evaluation criteria that your customer cares about. Pick a set of competitors or players in the landscape in your domain who are trying to build similar solutions and then score them in terms of their feature functionality. That gives you a real good picture in terms of where you're good and where you need to catch up. We go to the next. Now, if you really look at um, you know, the competitive differentiation, how do you build that competitive differentiation and barriers of entry so that your competitors don't catch up with you? Um, we talked about deep functionality was important, price affordability was important, enterprise integration was important. What are the factors that drive those things? Price affordability, for example, you need cloud, uh, you need usage pricing or value pricing. And then you have an India R&D that drives your cost advantage. So you need to make sure that all these three kind of come together so that you achieve the price advantage. Deep functionality to be able to achieve this particular competitive differentiation element, you got to have an anchor module. In this case, a performance management was the anchor module for the company. 
and you need deep domain expertise and strong software skills. So by finding out what are the necessary ingredients to enable that key factor that a customer cares about, you're building competitive differentiation. And that is very, very important. The pause here, any questions? Okay, we move to the next slide on value innovation. Yeah, I, I think uh, yeah, essentially, uh, in, a, in a nutshell, if you look at the blue ocean, is, is the idea is how to make uh, you know your competition irrelevant, right? Which means you need to find your holy grail. You need to create your own blue ocean, rather than fighting it out with uh, ten other players, you know, in your own in the red ocean, which is already into existence. Uh, which brings me, um, you know, to the to the second framework within Blue Ocean, which talks about value innovation. And uh, to put it simply, I think value innovation, uh, you know, on one side, while the goal and the objective is uh, to lower your cost, uh, which essentially, you know, uh, and we'll talk a bit more about the four action framework or what what is also called as ERRC, eliminate, raise, reduce, create. Uh, while on one side the goal is to lower your cost, I think the other side is how to uh, you know enhance the buyer's value, and and that is those are the areas where you need to create put put more you know impetus on as well as uh, raise you know the standards from what's uh, prevailing already uh, in the industry and in the market. So uh, again, if you look at it, I think uh, on the left hand side you know we talked about ERRC grid or eliminate, raise, reduce, create grid. Very simply, uh, you know, put eliminate basically talks about the factors that uh, you know the industry has long competed on and and should be eliminated for you, right? When you are kind of uh, uh, running your path and the way you have stitched your own differentiating point. Uh, second, you know, with respect to reduce again, these are the factors which probably you know customers uh, when when you talk about your value proposition uh, don't care about as significantly as probably they would the raise. Uh, you know the factors coming under raise, and therefore these factors should be reduced well below the industry standard. Uh, raise are certainly you know the factors which should be raised well above the industry standard because those are the points that you would want to compete on, or or uh, one of the points right which you would want to compete on, and and certainly eventually create are the factors which are very very core and critical, uh, uh, and and also kind of you know somehow connected to the core value proposition, and these are the factors which should be created that industry has never offered and essentially this becomes the blue ocean you know holy grail for you right so that's that's how it it kind of uh, simply summarizes and and uh, idea is again uh, you know if there's a new market space uh, and you want to make the competition irrelevant uh, how do you kind of do that uh, which results in high growth and profitability for your own, you know for your company for your organization in your own zone uh, we'll go to the next slide uh, so just put this in, in a bit of uh, context, uh, again, using the same reference of SE and SaaS company. I think if you look at it, we talked about, you know, with the business model, uh, uh, you know, more around SaaS and the recurring model, uh, there was a clear idea and an intention to eliminate the CAPEX, which is a huge cost for most of the organization. It's not aligned with a lot of customers kind of moving from on-premise to cloud. Two, I think, uh, you know, uh, with respect to race, uh, you know certain elements around uh, the the onboarding, the the customer engagement and support, the whole uh, you know delivery standards and the mobile experience. They wanted to raise to what some of their other competitors were offering, uh, because they realized that you know once that becomes the core value proposition for them, that will become a very very differentiated play and what most of the customers in their uh, you know targeted segment would 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 value for. Uh, reduce again. Uh, you know, uh, a lot of things they wanted to make it self-intuitive, uh, and uh, you know, very intuitive and kind of self-driven. Um, be it uh, you know the seamless onboarding, etc., and and uh, the need, more essentially, the need for having to deal with multiple vendors, right? So can we have uh, a lot of integrated, uh, you know, module uh, to the extent required by the organizations in our single stack? Uh, create, of course, uh, you know, like we discussed. Uh, uh, be it on the the consumerized experience, I would I would also say you know a bit of mobile first experience, you know where they wanted to go ahead with that and uh, very strongly anchor around certain very very you know uh, strong and deep modules, uh, whether with respect to performance management and employee engagement, uh, you know and and create new offerings depending on your user, be it for executives, for HR managers, 
uh, or for you know simple uh, kind of business managers, uh, different uh, predictive analytics and and the dashboards. Right. So I think I think that's where they they understood that this is this should give a leeway to their execution part. You know as they move forward and and in what manner they should distribute both their redistribute their energy and their resources uh, to ensure that you know uh, it, it remains aligned uh, with the with the overall thinking um, i'll i'll pause here uh, uh, i think uh, we will just take a quick stock if there's any any question otherwise we'll move forward we, we can I move forward i think all of these have uh, you know correlation um, don't look at this in isolation um, whether it's people purpose alignment where you start with why and that why is important not just for your team but why is also important for customers to buy from you the reason why customers buy the initial 510 customers that you get they buy from you because they love your energy you know startups energy and they trust the founders uh, otherwise it's so difficult you know to go against the big to go sell to big customers and compete against established companies so the team purpose alignment defines that then we talked about the bmc gets you a bird's eye view of your business then you need to understand your customer the emotional triggers so that you can craft your marketing campaigns you need to know your blue ocean otherwise you'll end up wasting a lot of time and money playing you know in a very established market so that's where strategy canvas kind of comes into play and then we talked about the value innovation and even your competitive differentiators in terms of where do you put your resources how do you focus and prioritize your resources yeah we go to the next uh, folks there's a lot of information here uh, and we're trying to cram all of this into a 75 minute session uh, feel free to as i said offline read these blogs watch these videos and and try and uh, create frameworks for your use cases and we're happy to uh, if required answer any of your questions let's go to the next slide the three I, kinds I of innovations yeah i think there's a question uh, satish uh, uh, so i just want to so yeah, there's one the, uh, um abhishek will you take that in the end sure okay great so types of innovation right there are three kinds of innovations you know efficiency innovations uh, performance improving or sustaining innovations and market creating innovations uh, a sustaining innovation uh, you know great example today would be iphone 10 11 9 whatever i think incremental versions uh, efficiency innovation you know in that particular industry more output and the jobs number of jobs shrink market creating innovation is primarily where you create a new class of products or services that didn't exist before and this market didn't exist before for example uh data right like a geo created data packs for everybody i mean earlier people thought data is only for rich people um likewise if you look at tesla for example people who wanted to buy electric cars so they created a new market there was not an existing market eventually they may get customers who are buying conventional cars to buy electric cars but that's a market creating innovation so if you have a product solution or service that fits into market creating innovation normally that's more valuable we go to the next slide and uh, you know on the x axis here you see uh, you're charging a lot more and you're charging less uh, this is compared to the incumbents and then on the y axis you see the product or solution performs uh, better or 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 equal or doesn't perform better so when you look at this um, differentiated strategy we talked about tesla right you know they charge more and they're much better as a car so people pay for it and that's kind of a differentiated strategy from a go to market perspective uh folks like netflix uh they charge you less and they were better than you know existing uh dvd rentals or even people going to theater again you know it's a different experience when you go to the theater you can compare but sitting at home and renting a dvd versus streaming uh netflix created a much better experience and they charge less and so that's a dominant strategy 
A disruptive is like you charge less, but the product also or solution may not have uh, features that others have. Like for example, Oppo or Vivo, you know, some of these phones, they promote themselves as smartphones with very powerful cameras, but they may not have all the features that an iPhone or uh, a Google Pixel or a Samsung has or a OnePlus but uh, still they would charge less and they may have less lesser you know number of features which is still okay that's in a disruptive strategy uh, it's important for you to figure out kind of where do you belong uh, in terms of uh, you know your own um, either in type of innovation or go to market strategy go to the next yeah i think we talked about this Yeah, so Abhishek now will walk you through the uh, uh, KPIs, uh, you know, scorecards and metrics. Uh, uh, unfortunately, I have to uh, leave now. You know, it's great, uh, you know, meeting uh, all of you or talking to all of you. Um, I'll let Abhishek, uh, uh, you know, drive the rest of the session, including the Q&A. Thank you, Abhishek. Thank you, Abhishek. Yeah. Thanks. So, so just... Uh... <laughs> I think that brings us, uh, you know, finally to uh, the section, uh, which is the monitoring section, uh, folks, which is, you know, the KPIs. Again, this is probably the most uh, used uh, segment and, and something which as entrepreneurs, as, as uh, management, key management, you are mostly aware of it. Uh, I think two, three points which I want to elaborate, but maybe let's move to the next slide, Harshita, and I'll bring that context as well. Uh, so, uh, uh, you know, I think four key parameters, you know, there are customer as a KPI, there is a financial, there is operations and product. And I think these are four essential parameters on which you would want to continuously monitor after, uh, uh, you know, exercising and kind of after, uh, you know, putting yourself to each of these frameworks and putting that to test. I think it becomes extremely important to eventually take a step back and see what are the things which are working or not. And I think these are, you know, these at the end of the day become a very tangible metric for you. Uh, to to uh, you know measure yourself or the progress of the company on right so when we talk about customer essentially uh, it's nothing but for a typical let's say you know SaaS company again you know in terms of the number of contracts closed uh, you know what's been the renewal and the churn rate what's the upsell what has been the adoption rate of different modules etc uh, two is with respect to product you know how are you performing uh, basis your own goal set which is the plan versus build, you know, the roadmap, are you in line with that? What are the kind of release versions you're looking for? Are you, have you have you kind of, uh, you know, created all, all channels that you wanted to target on, you know, mobile, web, etc. Uh, financials, of course, I think it becomes very, very intuitive, uh, you know, what kind of revenue, uh, recurring revenue growth rate you've seen if you're a subscription model, uh, you know, what's been the direct sales contribution versus the indirect sales contribution, what's the average contract value. And I think, uh, uh, again, you know, these are things which also help you understand your business in terms of, you know, are you, are you, um, uh, you know, kind of a place where typically, you know, in, in the SaaS world, it's, it's called, you know, be it on the, on, on the rabbit module or on the elephant module, you know, where your contract sizes are very large, but then typically sales cycles are very, very high uh, versus, you know, maybe the sales cycles are, are small, but then you are close to capturing the long tail market. Uh, and therefore, uh, you know, you play on those trends. So it gives, it starts giving a, a very strong feeler in terms of what as a business, you know, becomes your, uh, uh, I would say, uh, you know, financial outlook per se, right? And, and to basis some of these executions that you've done in the past with respect to some of these frameworks, are things moving in line or not? Finally, operations is uh, what helps you understand that what you need to do at the back end to ensure that all the other three metrics are aligned and continue to progress, uh, you know, mostly with respect to hirings or, or even uh, uh, trying to kind of fit certain uh, key partnerships, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, I think two key takeaways, you know, when it, come, when it comes to uh, KPIs and, and scorecards is to understand that one, it's very, very stage centric, depending on the stage of your company, uh, you know, product metric may make a lot more sense than, uh, you know, customer. Or customer may make a lot more sense than financials, right? Uh, two is at the same time, I think it's equally important to understand the business model that you have, right? As a SaaS company, if it's too much of uh, one-time implementation dependent or 
customization dependent and fundamentally there is a gap somewhere uh, and of course third uh, uh, one of the critical ones which we talked about it kind of gives you a very very strong indication of where things are headed so you know this this kind of brings uh, me uh, uh, to to the closure of the session and uh, and i'll open it up for questions and i'll also you know answer get to the question uh, which was already flagged uh, in the previous session uh, i think what uh, is very critical is that you as as entrepreneurs uh, go back and uh, number one go through these uh, you know the the exercises with your team with your core team uh, it's you know at some stage and i think all of us we've been entrepreneurs and operators at past and we do have a very strong intuition and understanding of of a lot of these things right but i think it's equally important to put it out there in, in these frameworks and like we mentioned i mean these are frameworks which have mostly been talked about in 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 a very isolated and independent manner but i think there is a very very strong reason for us to stitch this together as as a one unified framework because one without the other uh may only take you to that extent right whatever you you build on on strategy unless and until you are putting it in execution won't serve the purpose whatever you put on execution unless and until you have the right metrics to monitor whether it's working or not it won't serve the purpose so i think it and and once you know you monitor it you don't take that feedback and and readjust your course uh it's not going to serve the purpose so i think essentially it boils down to you going back uh you know reading through this and and doing it uh uh and see you know what comes out of it and two i would say you know some of the critical ones uh, it's important to kind of revisit it at at every uh you know significant juncture or milestone uh i'll probably just uh, i think uh, i'll also open it up for any further questions but i saw one question uh, you know from sonam uh i'll respond to that which is how to put a price point for the new services that we provide so let me let me start by saying so you know that when it comes to pricing i think it's uh, always has to be on a test roll right so it's always on the testing uh, i think the only way to know is by constantly tweaking your learning from your customers whatever you 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 get to see from them uh, but fundamentally if you look at it i think uh, at a high level there are two ways that that people go about it one you know it's a cost plus basis and the second is value based pricing right uh, i think everyone's eventual goal is to derive a value based pricing uh but it's not it's much easier said than done because that means you need to really understand the value of your product or services to your customer and it takes a bit of time and iteration for you to do that right uh, at the same time i think uh, the cost basis is what people generally start with uh, before they get clarity of of you know what essentially this means in the larger scheme of things in terms of value uh even with respect to i think if we talk about uh, what are various modes again if you look at you know the typical saas and the product there are a lot of premium experiments that that people do uh and and basis that they kind of uh, you know build their own pricing iterations and and come up with their own plans till they arrive at the meaningful one so net net uh, you know it it really depends on your business it really depends on the comfort that you have from your customers these are the understanding the value of your service and product to them uh but if it's completely new and you're starting with zero sum i've seen most of the time people either they draw and depend on the legacy of somewhat similar platforms or products and services and where your value proposition lie and and how would you want to position that visa vis pricing to you know just simply start with cost based uh to get the ball rolling and then in 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 the meanwhile uh you know do these tweaking do do these iterations iterations which will help you arrive at at a value and then you know you can move to the value based pricing i hope that that answers the question uh uh any any more questions i think uh, uh, you know at least uh, uh, please let me you know if there's any more question uh, otherwise uh, uh, okay uh, any thoughts on the waste management and recycling uh, industry post covid 19 i think not only waste management and recycling anand uh, you know a lot of uh, sectors sub sectors of course uh, will have to readopt and kind of uh, you know take a rebirth uh, and at this point uh, in time i think one can only speculate uh, from my perspective uh, you know if you ask me and we've done by the way a couple of uh, so there's one investment which we did which is by the way it uh, you know madras incubated a company called uh, signi uh, which then came out and they have uh, uh, you know uh, they are continuing their journey in hyderabad uh and that that is into into uh, you know the solar grid side the dc microgrid the inverter less uh, technology side i think uh 
clearly uh, while cyclical impact more or less in all the industry has been uh, very very headwind oriented uh, which is uh, you know there is a short to medium term impact where things have gone slow even more on the consumer discretionary side than so much on the in- enterprise side uh, but having said that uh, you know the whole uh, i would say uh, structural or i uh, you know the more long term is still uh, out out uh, you know for the jury as far as sustainability as a concept is concerned right the whole environmental consciousness i am sure you are also privy to lot of uh, uh, you know uh, social media um, uh, things that are getting forwarded these days where people are uh, you know uh, they are seeing lot of things coming back to shape right so i think i think from that perspective we believe that there will be a very strong consciousness at least in the minds of corporates as as things move forward uh for some time and and this thing will only uh, spruce up a bit uh where you know people will become lot more environmental conscious uh and and start taking things little bit more seriously uh and start visualizing things uh, you know even their regular business practices keeping these things in mind i see that in one of our uh, you know uh, specific companies case which is in the electric mobility space and and i don't see it will be very different i mean i i suspect it will be very different for other sectors as well in the and specifically the waste management and recycling one uh the next one is will uh, the edutech companies you know play vital part in students engagement uh, what are the difficulties in digital mode uh, so uh, at least the way things are uh, vasantan this is from vasantan uh, uh, absolutely it looks like edutech is probably <laughs> one of those uh, you know uh, sub sectors or sectors which probably will have more tailwind emerge than headwind uh, and even more you know when it comes to digital ec- uh, digital education i think uh, while uh, you know till some point in time we have seen various uh, edutech companies you know some of those of course have kind of scaled uh, leaps and bounds and raised uh, you know huge lot of money while people can question on their monetization ability at that stage but i think now a very strong user adoption is also coming into play uh, where a lot of offline you know schools and universities are also bringing in order to ensure that there is regular engagement and and more and more i mean less and less breaks right in between and hiccups i think they are moving to to digital right so i think that from that perspective there is uh, there is less doubt that uh, online education digital education edutech uh, will probably grow significantly uh, of course some some bit of it has already happened in the past i think now with adoption increasing and people uh, you know uh, going through this this whole uh, crisis there is a very strong new norm expected so i would say yes i think i think edutech will certainly and should certainly play a strong role yeah yeah i think i mean i, I see uh, i see a lot of uh, sector specific uh, you know questions for consumer based market space how should i proceed with Uh, for channeling and marketing with less money in hand uh i think uh, you know <laughs> honestly don't get me wrong and and i you know the, the name is not there but that's where some of these frameworks come very handy because i think it's not uh, it's not just for the sake of it even during times like these where as organizations you need to regroup and see that there's a very strong external sentiment now playing out uh, and it could be for or against and there is a new norm potentially that may emerge uh you either uh, you know survive and hope that that new norm doesn't come and things come back to original self or you you kind of be agile and nimble enough to see you know where can be some of the white spaces where we can move and i can give you one example again from a portfolio company for a digital health company right uh, how they have kind of now uh, come uh, and 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 made lot more online subscriptions happen in the past couple of months uh, and lot more specific ones uh, oriented towards some of these ongoing crises which has also helped them kind of push some of the other subscriptions uh, because you know the adoption becomes lot more easier so again consumer is a very very uh, you know big space uh, it's a it's a huge space by itself and there are various business models you know within consumer play uh, if it's if it's about the discretionary spend i think there is no denying that there is going to be a little bit of a road jam the way we see it uh but certainly some of the essential ones i think as you would have also noticed will continue to uh you know only scale and scale the big basket of the world etc i think the key then becomes how do you channel and rechannel some of those product packaging you know keeping some of these uh, new norms in mind uh, and 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 ensuring that 
while things are going slow uh, certainly there is no merit in in doing uh, you know marketing and channeling because if your end customers have gone slow uh, i think one of the key things what what you should look at or relook at is to bring those you know those marketing elements down right i think doubling down or continuing your marketing spend at this stage only makes for for businesses which see certain tailwinds emerge out of it uh, otherwise that's been that's been the sentiment wide and large uh, that you know you cut down some of these uh, uh, expenses go back you know see where are those certain white spaces that potentially can be a tailwind uh, or else you know wait for these moves go a bit slow and then you know when things come back uh, to normal see i think you know go and double down then but my understanding is understanding that new norm is very very critical and and pivoting at an early stage is much easier or repivoting and readjusting than later so uh, i i hope that answered your question but uh, i think uh, that that kind of brings us uh, uh, you know to to the end again we are all accessible uh, you know folks thank you so much for taking the time out i hope it was meaningful uh, uh, but i would seriously seriously strongly urge for you uh, you know to go back uh, you know read through this and more importantly i think i think uh, uh, go through these exercises because you you would have some time as well with with some of your core teams and you'll see a lot of things will emerge out of it right uh, thank you so much and and it was uh, you know privileged taking this session thanks a lot take care